Okay, so uh, book one ends. Uh, Socrates uh, has sort of succeeded in, in uh, getting Thrasymachus to basically give up. Uh, Thras Thrasymachus, of course, started by saying justice is the advantage of the stronger. Uh, Socrates pointed out various problems with figuring, uh, figuring out exactly how to understand that definition. Uh, and he sort of, you know, created problems for, th for Thrasymachus, forced him to further refine his definition, caused further problems. Finally, Thrasymachus sort of got angry with these, with this sort of uh, more precise form of argumentation, gave a big powerful speech about how injustice is actually bigger, is, is actually better than justice. And then Socrates and Thrasymachus spend the rest of book one debating which is better, justice or injustice. Uh, Thrasymachus obviously not fully convinced by Socrates' arguments, uh, but eventually he blushes. It's, not entirely clear what that means, but eventually he blushes and essentially gives up and simply agrees with whatever Socrates says. Then at the end of book one, Socrates says, oops, we never actually established what justice is, therefore the, all these debates, all these discussions, arguments we've been having about which is better, justice or injustice, that was all kind of beside the point because we can't obvi obviously we can't establish whether something is good, good or bad or whether one thing is better than another when we don't actually have a definition for these things. So he says, well, you know, we, we, we don't actually, we haven't really established anything. We still don't even know what justice is, much less do we know whether it's good or bad, whether it's better or worse than injustice. So he says, you know, that, that's kind of how book one ends. So book two begins with, with Glauc, you know, Socrates probably somewhat jokingly saying, well, and when that happened, I thought I was free from argument. But as he puts it, Glaucon is most courageous in everything. Uh, the idea being, uh, of course, in, in the first point, in, in the first case, obviously, Glaucon, despite having seen these, these various speakers in uh, book one, sort of refuted by Socrates, including Thrasymachus, a professional sophist, someone who obviously speaks well for a living, argues convincingly for a living, Glaucon, despite seeing all of that, uh, goes ahead and, and, and wants to sort of continue the conversation and wants to continue the conversation precisely on the question of, you know, what is justice? So he's courageous in that way. He's not afraid of, uh, to keep talking, even though uh, it could be a difficult discussion, but also maybe courageous in, this in, in terms of his thought. As we'll see, he, he makes a lot of the same arguments as Thrasymachus, but he makes them in many ways uh, in a much more radical and therefore in a way a much more courageous way, uh, that, that, that his thought is far more courageous, far more daring than, than most people's. Uh, so... In book two, you know, Glaucon, Adiamantus, two brothers, Plato's brothers, they both make their own speeches and kind of direct the, the uh, really the rest of the book. They are the main speakers along with Socrates. And, and uh, one of the things that we see in book one, I mean, Cephalus didn't really, you know, strongly or, or uh, you know, militantly provide a, a definition of justice and say, I know what justice is, but he sort of implicitly did that. And Socrates, you know, brought out the problems with that. Uh, Polemicus and, and Thrasymachus both kind of thought that they knew what justice was. They were fairly certain. They were proposing definitions, arguing for them. Uh, Glaucon and Adiamantus, somewhat more perplexed, somewhat less dogmatic than the others. I mean, they, they, they both seem to have a, a definition of justice that they're kind of operating with. Uh, but but they, but they want to know is justice good or not? Socrates, you know, explain this to me. Let's think about it. They're, they're much less concerned with telling Socrates uh, what is the truth and then having to, to, to defend that. They're much more curious or, or just uncertain and, and confused and wanting to know what is the truth. Help me figure this out. Help me think through this. Uh, so Glaucon starts. He says, you know, do, do he starts and says, you know, do you want to, as, as he puts it, do you want to uh, really to have convinced us or to have seen to have convinced us? So he introduces this distinction between reality and appearance, or reality and seeming, the way that things might seem. Uh, very important distinction for a lot of philosophy, and very important for Glaucon's speech. So he says, Socrates, right now, Thrasymachus has given up. He claimed to agree. Everybody else is being quiet. Uh, do you want? Is is that okay? I mean, it, it looks like there's the appearance that you've convinced everybody. But really, in reality, probably everybody is still unsure of exactly what's going on. Thrasymachus obviously isn't convinced. I'm not convinced. Do you want the appearance of having convinced everybody? Everybody just, uh, you know, is, is sort of quiet and, and doesn't question anymore? Or do you want to really convince us? And Socrates says, well, you know, if it were up to me, I, I, I want to really convince you. So Glaucon says, well, you're not, you're, you're not getting what you want. And so he says, you know, listen to what I have to say. And he int introduces this idea. He distinguishes between three classes of goods. And he says, there's the first class, things that are good simply for their own sake. He says, we, we desire them for nothing other than, than the experience of having them themselves. And it's kind of hard to come up with examples of this. He says something like, you know, harmless enjoyments, things that we enjoy, and there, there, there's no real after effect. We, we don't get any benefit from this thing other than actually the, the pleasure and, or, or the enjoyment of the experience itself. So maybe listening to music would be an example of this. Glaucon says, so there's this first type of good which you desire simply for its own sake. And Socrates says, yes, I think there is such a thing. And then Glaucon says, then there's a second class of goods. And again, these are all good things. Things that are good both for their own sake and for their consequences. 
So it gives the example of thinking. Thinking is good for its own sake. It's pleasant to think. It's enjoyable to, you know, to, to, to think about things, to, to see things more clearly, to understand things. And then it's good for the consequences, for having greater you know, clarity, greater understanding of how to act, maybe greater understanding of, you know, maybe as, as things become clear to you, they bother you less, et cetera. So there are consequences to thinking that, that also make it good. Uh, he says health is another one. Obviously, just being healthy is good for its own sake. Physical health is a good thing. Uh, but he says it's also good for its consequences that you can then, you know, go around, act, do whatever else you want without having to worry about your health, without having to, to take care of yourself and nurse yourself and so on. So he says, you know, health is another example. It's good for its own sake. Being healthy is good for its own sake. It's also good for the consequences. He says seeing, again, another example. Uh, it's, it's pleasant to be able to see, to see colors, to look out the window and see all kinds of things. That's good for its own sake. It's also good for the consequences that you're not walking into things and so on. So. He says, you know, th these, there's this second class, things that are good for their own sake and good for the consequences. And then he says there's a third class, which is basically just drudgery. He says these are things that they're good, but they're good only for their consequences. So he says gymnastics, he says, you know, the only reason that people exercise, and we'll see Glaucon much more, uh, not, not uh, very ascetic at all, although he can become ascetic later on in the book. He's sort of, as long as it's, it's extreme, he's sort of drawn to it. But, but you know, he's, he's not big on the exercise for its own sake. Uh, he says, you know, exercise, it gives you health, but by itself, it's not actually good. Uh, you, you, nobody exercises simply for the sake of exercising. You do it for the consequence, health. Uh, other examples, we might say brushing your teeth or flossing your teeth or something. I mean, you know, no one, I mean, presumably no one really enjoys that. You just do it for the sake of not, not getting cavities. And, and Glaucon, interestingly, he says all the things that are done for money, if you're doing something for money, it's a sign that you don't actually value it for its own sake. You're doing it only for the money. It's obviously a very aristocratic attitude. But if you're doing something for the money, it's a sign that, that you're not doing it for its own sake, but only, as he puts it, for the wages. So he says there's this third type of good, this third class of good, which are, you know, again, they are good, but they're only good for their consequences. And no one would ever choose them for their own sake at all. Uh, and Socrates says yes. And Glaucon says, in, in which class of these goods do you think justice is? And Socrates says he thinks it's in the second class, uh, the class of things that are good for their own sake and good for their consequences. And Glaucon says, well, that's not what the many think. Most people don't agree with you. He says they think that justice falls into the third category, the category of drudgery, the category of things that you do only for the sake of their consequences, uh, things that you would never choose for their own sake, but that you choose only, again, as he puts it, for the wages in the case of justice, obviously, not being punished for committing injustice, and also the good, the, the good opinion you get from, from people thinking that you're just the good things that come to you from a good reputation, a, a good opinion that people have of you. So he says, you know, th th this is what most people think that justice is. And he says, you know, I've, I've heard all of these arguments like, th like the ones that, that Thrasymachus has made uh, in favor of, of injustice, but he says, I'm not fully convinced. And he says, because I've been talked deft by these people, but he says, I'm not fully convinced, but at the same time, I can't really find the way to refute them. So I'm not convinced by the arguments against justice, the arguments in favor of injustice, but I'm also not convinced that they're not true. I can't quite think of how to refute them myself. So he says, what I'd like to do is make the strongest case against justice and in favor of injustice, make the strongest case that I possibly can, and then have you refute that. Have you show me why that's wrong so that I can finally be convinced that justice is in fact good, for good and, and is in fact better than injustice. Socrates says, that sounds good to me. So, so, so Glaucon says, as he puts it at uh, 358C, he says, first I'll tell what kind of thing they say justice is. Again, he's saying this is other people's argument, not mine. But he says, first I'll tell what kind of thing they say justice is and where it came from. Second, that all those who practice it do so unwillingly as necessary but not good. Again, necessary is something that you have to do but not actually good. Third, that it is fitting that they do so, for the life of the unjust man is, after all, far better than that of the just man. So again, he says, I'll say where it is, you know, what, what they say justice is, where it came from. They, uh, then I'll give their argument that those who practice it do so unwillingly is something that's necessary but not good. And then finally, I say, and that, that, that makes sense because the life of the just man is better than that of the unjust, uh, that the life of the unjust man is better than the life of the just man. So it makes sense that people practice justice only unwillingly because injustice would actually be better for them. So he says, you know, that's the, those are the arguments that I'm going to make. They agree, and so Glaucon begins his speech, and immediately at 358E, he begins by saying, they say that doing injustice is naturally good. So he immediately bases his argument on nature. Again, we saw with Thrasymachus the, 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 way, the, the indications that Thrasymachus is actually relatively conventional. 
Uh, in many ways, his speech seems radical or seems cynical or seems daring, but in many ways there were these signs that he was very conventional. He was very concerned with things like, like honor and money and things like that. And throughout his speech, he never, he never once referred to nature. He didn't try to base his argument on nature. Glaucon immediately begins by saying, look, if you really want to make the argument against justice, the argument you would make is not that the unjust person gets the better in contracts or something like that. The way you would really make the argument against in, against justice and in favor of injustice is to say what is naturally good. And you would, you know, if you wanted to argue against justice, you would say justice is naturally bad. Injustice is naturally good. By nature, naturally, we all have these selfish desires that are inside of us, and it's law, it's convention that that, that teaches us and that forces us to check those selfish desires. But naturally, we're all naturally selfish. We all want what's best for us, not what's best for other people, or even what's equally good for us and other people. We all want what's best for us. We all want to, to have the best for us. So Glaucon, the argument begins, they say that doing injustice is naturally good. Uh, that the argument is, again, naturally what we want is what's best for us, and, and therefore to commit injustice and not worry about other people, not worry about what's good for other people, but simply to, to pursue our own natural good. And he says, and the, the, so then where does justice come from? Uh, if, if, if injustice is naturally good, why do we have justice at all? Why do we have law at all? And he says, well, you know, obviously suffering injustice is naturally bad. I mean, so in other words, you know, if there's a, if there's a, uh, if, if somebody has something that, that, that I want and I go and take it from them by force, that's good for me naturally because I'm getting something that's good for me, but it's obviously bad for that person because they're suffering injustice, and that's obviously naturally bad for them to lose their, you know, their, 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 sh their uh, stake or whatever it is that they lose because I take it, that's naturally good for me, but naturally bad for them. So he says what actually happens is that when you have no law and you have this sort of conflict among selfish people, very quickly people realize that although they, they, they think that they're going to come out on top, that they think that they're going to be the ones who will commit injustice su successfully, they quickly realize that very few people are actually going to do that. Only a very few people can actually thrive in a situation where there is no law. And those people can commit injustice successfully, but the vast majority cannot, and so they, they're in the worst situation of not being able to commit injustice on their own, but having to suffer other people's injustice. And as he puts it, they can't even avenge themselves. If you suffer injustice but can at least avenge yourself, well, it's still, there's still at least you have the good of vengeance. But in this case, they can't do anything. Uh, so an example I often use in class is that we had a, a jar of jelly beans. Everyone in class wants the entire jar for themselves. But if a fight breaks out over the jar and people are committing injustice, harming, fighting each other, hurting each other to get the, the jar of jelly beans, very quickly they realize one person is going to do much better than every, you know, let's say that Bruce Lee is in the class and he's sort of obviously, you know, having a pretty easy time taking out everybody else and people quickly realize, I want the whole jar of jelly beans for myself, but I'm simply not going to get them. I mean, it, it's clear now, at first I thought I would be able to, but it's clear now that I'm not going to be able to, and worse than that, you know, Bruce Lee just, uh, you know, broke f both of my arms or something, and so now I have broken arms and no jelly beans. It's much better for, and, and suddenly everybody's, you know, huddling in the corner just trying to stay away from Bruce Lee, and they realize we can sit here and huddle in this corner and fight over who gets to eat this bug, or we can actually gang up, overcome Bruce Lee, put him in jail, you know, kill him, whatever, and then divide the jelly beans evenly. So we eat, there are 100 jelly beans and there are 50 students in the class, we each get two jelly beans. This is obviously not the ideal. Nobody wants two jelly beans, they want the entire jar, but again, very unfortunate, difficult experience has taught them that, that in fact, uh, they're not going to get the entire jar. So what's, what's best for them, what, what would be best for them naturally to get everything that they want is not a realistic option. What's worse for them to suffer injustice without being able to avenge themselves, that is a realistic option. So they choose what's in the middle, justice. They choose creating a contract, creating law, a law that basically forces everybody more or less to, to as Glaucon puts it, honor equality. So an important part of justice is, is, is setting up a system which treats everybody as basically equal. Uh, not necessarily in the sense of, of, you know, guaranteeing that everybody has the same outcome or giving them exactly the, the same amount of property, but, but a law which basically says all citizens should be treated equally. Uh, some citizens shouldn't have more than others. You can't simply go around taking it. If you can take other people's stuff and get away with it, you get to keep it. No, that's obviously not law. So he says, you know, basically people are in this situation. They realize that, that they're not going to get what they want, that although they all want to commit injustice, they can't actually do it. Instead, they just end up suffering injustice. So they decide to create a, a law, a contract, where they basically get, get what's second best, a compromise between what they really want and what they really don't want. In the middle, they get at least a little bit of what they want, they get at least a couple of jelly beans, and they get security, obviously. 
So he says, you know, that's where that's where the law comes from. Obviously, this is very similar to, to social contract theory. The difference is that Glaucon sees this as being a, a bad thing. He says this is this is actually bad. It's 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 it's, it's against nature. Uh, the argument that he's making is that what's naturally good again is injustice. The law then is 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 unnatural. It goes against nature. And for most people, that's that's okay because that's the best that they can do. But he says for the truly strong, for the as he puts it, someone who's a real man would never agree to this. Someone who could actually thrive in that situation and actually get what's naturally best for them be the natural victor rather than, than, than the natural victim. He says, for that person, it's, it's not good. They would never agree to this. They, they have to be forced into it in some way. So it's again, it's very much like social contract theory. People are basically selfish, but they come together and they make these contracts and they decide to cooperate for the sake of, of getting what they want, you know, what, what they want selfishly, but to sort of second best and compromising between what they really want and what they really don't want and sort of you know joining into this uh, 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 this this contract to get certain selfish things for themselves, but whereas obviously social contract theory is saying this is a good thing, uh, this compromise that we all give up some of our freedoms in order to have more fundamental ones protected, Glaucon sees this as a bad thing, uh, as as basically again at least bad for for the for the naturally strong, the people who could actually thrive in the situation, and actually get what they naturally want on their own rather than having to compromise. Uh, so as he puts it. Uh, um, this is what any nat nature naturally pursues as good, while it is law which by force perverts it to honor equality at 359C. So he says, what any nature naturally pursues as good is, is its own advantage. What is actually good for it, again, not, not treating everybody else as equal, but actually pursuing what's, what's best for itself, and it's law which uses force to, as he puts it, pervert it to honor equality. Uh, so as, as you know, Thrasymachus had argued that justice is the advantage of the stronger, Glaucon argues, no, it's the exact opposite. Justice, the law, is the advantage of the weaker. It's the weaker who benefit from this situation, not the stronger. The stronger are the ones who could, who could uh, thrive and succeed in, in a situation where there is no law. The stronger are the ones who, by nature, could actually get what they naturally want, could actually naturally uh, do well in that situation, and again, get, get what's really naturally good. The law exists to help the many weak people get a little bit of what they want, uh, again, according to nature. But, but for the really good ones, it, it, it sort of, it, it's very bad for them. So again, it's the advantage of the weaker, not the stronger. Um, and so you know, he sort of says, so this is, this is the idea. This is what justice is. This is where it comes from. Again, if justice isn't naturally good, if injustice is naturally good, where does it come from? Well, wh why do we have justice? Why do we have law at all? And he says, well, because it's, it's a compromise. The many weak people get together and decide to cooperate and, and decide to, to, to create a system of law which treats them more or less as equals. Uh, so they get a little bit of what they want and a little bit of security, uh, but, but it's not nearly everything that they want. So, so it's, it's a huge uh, compromise, and again, it's, it's not really naturally what's good for them. It's just what they can, it's, it's a little bit of what's naturally good for them, and it's, it's the most that they can get. So he says, you know, uh, to show this, he says, if we were really going to show how this is true, uh, he says, you know, the, the, the example of, that we would use is, he says, if, if you look at just and unjust people, people who you think are just and people who you think are unjust, he says, the, the proof of this argument would be that if you gave them both the chance to do whatever they wanted, he says, you know, you would find the, the supposedly just person doing the same as the unjust person if they thought they could get away with it. And he says, you know, here's an example of what I'm talking about. And he tells this story of the Ring of Gyges. And he says, you know, the, the, this, uh, this shepherd was in the field, and he was, you know, just sort of out there, a lowly shepherd, just watching the flock for someone else. And he says, one day he was out there, and there was this terrible thunderstorm, and there was a, a thunder and lightning, obviously, and, and the earth split open. There was an earthquake of some sort, and he went down into this chasm, and there were all sorts of wondrous things down there, and he saw a giant horse with, uh, sort of, not an actual horse, but a giant bronze horse with windows. He looked inside. There was a there was a corpse that seemed to be larger than a human being, and it was naked except it was wearing a ring. So it's a very kind of spooky, uncanny story, full of you know a thunderstorm and the earth opens and you go down there and there's all kinds of wondrous things and then you see this 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 kind of larger than life corpse and obviously a lot of people oh, I, I would run away, but but this this shepherd is he's he's not afraid, he's not uh, he's not intimidated. He goes in, he takes the ring off, and then he leaves. And then you know the, the story is well. Then he was at a meeting and he realized he was wearing the ring and he realized if he turned the ring around, it made him invisible. Uh, and so he tried it a few times and he realized yes, this this ring has a magical power; it makes you invisible. So as Glaucon says, he he immediately when he figured this out, he contrived to be sent as a messenger to the king. Um, he had an invisible ring. I don't know why he had to contrive to be a messenger. I think he could just make himself invisible and walk into the castle. But he contrived to make himself a messenger to the king. 
And once he was in there, he immediately went and, and slept with the queen. And then he says, you know, the, the, the queen and, and uh, the shepherd went and, and attacked the king and killed him. So, you know, the, the, the queen sleeps with Gyges and she immediately says, well, let's go kill my husband. I mean, this was no easy divorces in these days, especially not if you were married to the king. So, so this person who had been a lowly shepherd using the ring gets in, has sex with the queen, the most beautiful, um, probably one of the most beautiful, the most powerful woman in the kingdom, takes over the king, you know, becomes the ruler. And then Glaucon says, you know, that this is what anybody would do if they could. No one who had this ring would actually remain just. And he says, you know, all the things that they could do. And he says, take whatever they wanted to from the market, uh, enter houses, sleep with whomever they wanted to, uh, slay or release from bonds. Apparently a lot of his friends were in jail or something, but you, know, you can kill whoever you want to. You can put into prison, release from prison, sleep with whoever you want to, take whatever you want to, as he puts it, live as a god among human beings. If you had this power to do whatever you wanted to, and of course at this point, forget about the ring, let's just say if you gave somebody the power to simply do whatever they wanted to with no consequences, without being punished, he says everybody would choose to be unjust. Everybody would choose to gratify their own desires and not worry about whether what they were doing was just or whether they were treating others as equals and, and doing the right thing and treating them well. He says if people had this power, everybody would do it. And he said if, if, it, it, if it happened that, that, you know, that, that there was someone who got the ring, if there was someone who was so pure or so naive or whatever it was and they got the ring and they didn't use it for these purposes, and, and they told people, Glaucon says, they would seem wretched. Everybody else would think that this one simpleton who had actually thrown the ring away or destroyed it or hadn't used it to do anything, so they would think that he was actually wretched. They would feel, they would think, oh, that's so terrible. You know, you had this great chance and you blew it. And he says, but they would also kind of despise him. They would think he was a fool. Though he says, you know, to themselves, they would praise him. Everybody keeps up the hypocrisy of, of praising justice because, again, they're all afraid of suffering injustice. You know, this was something that, that, that Thrasymachus mentioned in passing but didn't really develop. Glaucon focuses on this a lot. The real reason that people praise justice isn't because they actually believe in it, because he says at the same, in the, in the next breath, if you hear them the way that they talk about it, they think that injustice is difficult. It's, as he puts it, drudgery. It's something that you do only for the, for the, for the reputation, for the good things that come from it. So he says, you know, people would, would praise this person to, to each other to keep up this pretense of, oh, yes, justice is very important, justice is good, yes, you did the right thing. But again, that's only because they're afraid of suffering injustice. So they don't want to give anybody the idea that they should go ahead and, and go out there and actually practice injustice. Uh, they, they, they want to keep up this idea, keep up this lie, keep telling this lie to each other and hope that everybody else believes it, that yes, justice is actually good and that's what we should all be doing. But Glaucon says, again, you know, the argument would be that it's not naturally good. Justice is actually naturally bad, or at least a, a very severe compromise uh, in terms of what's naturally good. That injustice is what's naturally good. That therefore nobody willingly is just. And that the proof of this is that if you gave people the power to be unjust without suffering any penalty, they would all do it. So then he goes on to his, his final part of the speech, and he says, you know, let's imagine, as he puts it at one point, consider justice and injustice alone in the soul. So again, remember... Polemarchus and Socrates, when they had been talking about justice, they had kind of been looking for something like this. Justice is a good thing, almost like justice is a virtue. Thrasymachus kind of, you know, shooed that, said that's, that, that's ridiculous, dismissed that idea from the conversation. Glaucon now brings it back in very clearly and says, let's look at justice and injustice alone in the soul, as he puts it. If somebody is just, if somebody is, is, is unjust, how does that work? I mean, are, are, are they, is, is there any good that comes from being just, simply from having that as a virtue, simply from having that as a quality in your soul? Is there any good that comes from justice? And that's, of course, what he's sort of you know, driving. He wants to hear that that's true, but he says, I'm, I'm, again, I'm making the argument against this view. So he says, if we just look at justice and injustice alone in the soul of somebody, so take away all of the positive consequences of being just, as he puts it, otherwise you don't know why they're doing it. If someone is just and as a result they have a good reputation and everybody respects them and, and people you know, rush to help them when they need something because everybody thinks well of them and thinks that they're a good person, well, are, are they doing this because they really care about being just or because being just is what's, what's actually good because you know, justice is a good that, that, that is worth having more than, more than anything else? Or are they just doing it because they realize that, that, the, that the consequences are good for them? You know, the phrase honesty is the best policy not saying that you should be honest for its own sake, it's saying, you know, honesty will ultimately be, be to your benefit in the long run. Uh, if you lie to people, if you cheat, they'll figure it out and then they'll stop dealing with you, uh, and, and that obviously won't be good. So therefore, be honest, not because you actually think that that's a good thing, but because being honest is, is the sort of enlightened way to, to get what you want. I mean, you're getting you, you, the same basic things, that, it's the same basic set of things that you want, the same basic attitude as being dishonest, 
just when you're honest, you're more self-aware, you're more aware of how to actually get those things consistently over the long term. So it's just kind of, you know, un understanding your own self-interest better. Glaucon is saying, well, you know, in that case, we don't really, is somebody really just, or are they simply just, you know, more more aware of how to get what they want, uh, you know, more more prudent and, and more, uh, more, more, more prudent, but also maybe a, a little bit more cowardly than someone who's more aggressive, someone who tries to become a tyrant or, or you know, breaks you know, massive laws and tries to commit injustice in some massive way. Does the just person actually want anything different from them? Are they actually a different person internally from from the from the would-be tyrant, from the from the criminal, or are they simply someone who realizes, well, I think I'm I'm going to do better just to obey the laws and and to get my rewards from following the rules. And Glaucon says, so we have to take all of that away. We have to take all away all of these positive consequences of being just and look at what would happen if somebody were unjust, what would happen if somebody were just without any of the, of, of the positive things. I mean, obviously he's not saying, well, what about injustice? Is that a good? Is that some, some powerful thing? Is that, is that something you would choose for its own sake? Uh, what if we took away all the benefits of being unjust? Would somebody still want to be unjust? No, of course not. I mean, if somebody, you know, does robbed and, and stole and lied to people and then it turned out they got none of that it's not like they would step back if they somehow lost all of their uh, all of the all of the money and so on that they had stolen and they would never step back and say well at least I was unjust at, at least I can you know at least I can feel good about that no the whole reason they were unjust is not because that's a good in itself the whole reason they were unjust is to get some other something else from it to, to, to benefit in some way to get something like money or some other good that they were pursuing unjustly uh, whereas justice, again, you know, if somebody is just and then they, they don't have a reputation for it, again, Glaucon is saying, would they step back and say, well, at least I'm just, and that's the important thing. It's not whether or not people think I'm just. It's not whether or not I benefit from having a good reputation as being a just person. What's important is, am I actually just myself? Do I really have justice in my soul? Does that make me good? Does that make me happy? So Glaucon says, let's look at it in the purest way we can. Let's take an unjust person who obviously, you know, he says the, the, the perfect injustice would be knowing to, to, to cultivate a reputation for justice. Really being unjust would be uh, obviously in the first place being unjust and then secondly having the reputation for, for justice. So you get all of the benefits of being uh, unjust and then you also get all the benefits of being just. And as he puts it, uh, you know, it, let, let's make him a good craftsman. Just like a doctor or a pilot, they understand that not everything in their art is possible. You know, we're not talking about a supervillain or somebody who just can do magical things or, or who tries to do magical things. Let's take someone who understands what's possible and what's not and knows how to practice injustice successfully and, again, knows how to make people think that he's actually just. So he gets all the benefits of injustice and all the benefits of justice. And then he says, let's take, on the other hand, somebody who is genuinely just but, t but makes no effort at all to seem that way. He simply doesn't care about the reputation. He doesn't care about the appearance, as he puts it. What will happen to this person? And then he goes very far and says, in fact, let, let, let's go even further. Let's say that they actually have the reputation. Let's say they actually seem unjust. What will happen to this person? And he says, you know, if it's rustically told. And at this point, uh, Socrates kind of breaks in and says, Glaucon, you know, you polish them up like, like two statues, implying maybe that there's something a little bit artificial about what he's saying. And Glaucon says, well, as much as I can. Again, the idea would be maybe this would never quite happen. But again, we're trying to figure out here what is really good. Is, is justice really good? And is it good, again, is it good for its own sake? So here, you know, Glaucon is sort of going beyond what Socrates had said, that justice is a good for its own sake and for its consequences, that justice is part of that second class of good, th th those goods that, that, that are good for their own sake and good for their consequences. Glaucon is kind of pushing beyond that and saying, what if you take away all the consequences, all the wages, as he puts it, and what you had was only justice that was good for its own sake? Would you actually still choose to be just simply for its own sake? Is it actually that part of that first class of goods? those goods that are good and, and worth having simply for their own sake. And he says, and again, what happens, and then, then he goes even further, really, and says, what if somebody is tortured to death? What if, what if somebody gets is thought to be unjust and therefore is, 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 is uh, arrested and, and uh, punished in all these terrible ways and has all these terrible things done to them? He says, at that point, they would think, I wish I had you know, appeared to be just rather than genuinely been just. But here he's pushing very far in the direction of saying, you know, justice should be, I don't just want you to, to, to refute this argument, Socrates. What I want to believe is not just that justice is good or not just that this argument can be refuted. What I want to believe is that justice is good for its own sake and, in fact, so good that, that it's worth any kind of, cons any, any kind of sacrifice, that, that, that it's worth any kind of uh, difficulty or sacrifice you may make for it. So here we see you know, Glaucon wanting something that is you know, almost, he's almost like a potential fanatic 
someone who wants something that is so good, a kind of all-consuming good that is worth any kind of sacrifice, that is better than anything else you might get by being unjust. Uh, but he says, you know, so the just person being, being thought uh, to be unjust is punished, is, is tortured. Um, he says, and now let's, let's look over at the unjust person. And again, he's making this speech against justice. Uh, he says, let's look over at the unjust person. They have the appearance. They're able to do all kinds of things. He says, they're strong in the city. They benefit. They have money. Therefore, he, he kind of goes back then and uh, addresses some of the previous definitions of justice. He says, they're strong. They, 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 they benefit in the city. He says, they, 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 therefore, they can help friends, harm enemies. Goes back to Polemarch as his definition of justice, obviously. And says, they're able to do that. And he says, and because they have money, again, they, they can make good sacrifices to the gods. Uh, they, they, they can sacrifice to the gods. They can make, I think it says, adequate and magnificent or something. So not just adequate, but, but magnificent, but both at the same time. So they can make these sacrifices to the gods. And again, therefore, he says, that likely they're, they're beloved by gods. So again, goes back to, to Cephalus. So he says, you know, the unjust man has everything. He has power in the city. He has money. He can use that money for whatever he wants. And again, he comes back to the idea of you know, he can give in marriage. He can marry whoever he wants. He can give in marriage to who. Uh, uh, whoever he wants to, to to whomever he wants, and so he says, you know, all of these good things that the unjust person has in the city, and the just person has nothing. So this is sort of his argument that again, at the end, if if, if the unjust person uh, will ultimately benefit more. Again, that was that was kind of the uh, the uh, third part of his argument that, that you know that that the, that the life of the unjust man is better than that of the just man. That that's why people say that people uh, should choose. Uh, 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 injustice rather than justice. It, that's what's naturally good, and therefore, obviously, the life of the unjust man is going to be better. Uh, though, again, he's he's arguing all of this, basically wanting Socrates to come back and say none of this is true, but, or to sort of show him though why none of it is true. Although, again, he goes beyond, and he kind of starts by saying, well, the many think that justice is just drudgery. It's just part of this third and lowest class of goods. And so is, is that all that he wants Socrates to argue against is that particular view as it goes on and by the end again he's got this very dramatic vision of the just person being tortured to death and there he seems much more to be pointing towards uh, towards saying that what, what I want is to see that in fact justice is worth these great sacrifices uh, and again we'll see throughout the Republic I mean we, we won't go that far in this class but throughout the Republic there are many places where uh, Glaucon, uh, where there are very kind of intense demands being made on the citizens of this city that they found in speech, and Glaucon almost always is, is okay with it. Glaucon almost always, in fact, embraces these things. So again, he's clearly uh, 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 drawn to this, drawn to the idea of justice requiring great sacrifices. Uh, and so, so that's, that's his speech.